Well, thank you for showing up for a crazy title. So I, hopefully I live up to your expectations. So um, the title is Guns, Germs, and Microservices. My name is John Willis. Um, I do tell people I, I like to communicate on Twitter. So if something in this presentation excites you or you're interested, um, I, I would um, suggest trying to track me down that way. I do respond more there. I know it's a hard name. Just Google John Willis and Twitter. I come up first, I think, for that, for Twitter at least. Um, so the idea here is um, we're going to talk about kind of um, early tools, stone tools. We're going to talk about containers. We're going to talk about something called a Maxim machine gun. We're going to talk about microservices. We're going to talk about rapier swords, um, wheat, germs, and data gravity. Does that sound like fun? Yeah. Think so? OK, good. All righty then. So this is the presentation. I mean, just Ali, and then if you want the UWM capital X I. Um, yeah, if you want to get a picture of that or something like that. So that is, I put that up uh, this afternoon. So it's this deck. Um, I'm sure we'll distribute it through the um, deal. But um, so, and again, I'll, I'll tweet it out too. So if you want to track me down that way. So I, I, a couple of biographical things. I am Botch Galoop. Um, I do work at Docker now. I'm actually uh, in business development there. So if you've got a startup um, and you're doing things around Docker, give me a holler. Um, this is not a Docker presentation. Um, I've been 35 years in IT. I've done all sorts of things, particularly in operations my whole career. Um, I, I actually was one of the early cloud evangelists at Canonical when they were pushing the first, which was a eucalyptus-based cloud. I was the ninth person in at Chef. So I got to um, actually enjoy um, uh, an amazing opportunity to spend about a year and a half with uh, the people over there. Hired some fantastic people. The startup gods have been pretty nice to me over the last three, maybe. Uh, going on almost close to four. I had a company I sold to Dell called Instratius. And then eight months ago, I sold a company to Docker called Socket Plane. So um, I am a DevOps Day core organizer, um, one of the original core organizers. I was the only American in original Ghent DevOps Days. Um, I did the keynote on Silicon Valley last Friday. And it was my 35, 35th DevOps Days. And I, I'm pretty certain that I hold the record for the most amount of DevOps days anybody on the planet. Um, I'm also an organizer for DevOps Enterprise, the Enterprise Summit by Dean Kim. Um, I do, uh, this is the last, uh, my last promotion slide. Um, it, this one, the, the one, both of these are worth knowing uh, because we do a DevOps Cafe podcast. We interview amazing people. I mean, absolutely amazing people. You know, Jez Humble, Sidney Decker, Josh Corman, who I'm going to recommend race with me after this to go to his session. Uh, promise me. It'll be the second best presentation you'll see today. Ah, only kidding. Josh is in the room. Um, and, um, and, and I'm a co-author of something called The DevOps Handbook with Gene Kim and Jez Humble and um, Patrick Dubois, the godfather. So history, the Battle of Kajimakara. So this, um, this gentleman, uh, Francisco Pizarro, in 1532, 168 conquistadors, not very military trained, more explorers than military. They defeat an army of 7,000 with no injuries and no casualties on their side. A couple hundred years later, 300 years later, Battle of Shingangi or whatever it is, um, four British guns defeat five, an army of 5,000 Zulu. Um, and I'm not trying to be uh, gross here, but uh, I'm trying to make a point of like, why does this happen? Um, the easy answer is weapons, but that's, that's, you know, that's the simple answer. Why at some point in history is um, these two civilizations, the Incas and the Zulus, so under-equipped to deal with these other two um, nation states or nation groups, right? Why, why is that? And so um, actually, how many people have read Guns, Germs, and Steel? Yeah, a fair amount. It, it's an excellent book. In fact, I fell into this by accident. My, my son, he's in 11th grade last year, his summer project was to read this book. And I just had nothing to do, and I'm fumbling through. And early on, he talks about, so, so Jared Diamond is um, um, a geologist, or professor of geology at UCLA. And I'm thumbing through it, and he talks about the haves and have-nots. And, and I do a podcast with uh, Damon Edwards, as I said, and we interview a lot of people. And Damon is a brilliant man. And he always talks about this, that, the, you know, in IT, we're starting to see haves and have-nots. And I thought, my God, you know, I got to read this book, right? And I read the book. And, and what, what Diamond was basically saying was that, um, that Pizarro and the British soldiers 
kind of got lucky based on geography. And it wasn't just their, um, their, um, um, their, their swords, because it actually turned out to be swords, um, rapier swords, very malleable, amazingly built swords, or this Maxim machine gun, which was the first really fully caliber machine gun. Um, but there were other things involved. There were, um, in fact, um, Pizarro was, had actually strategy books because his cousin, Hernan Cortez, had fought the Aztecs 10 years earlier. So he actually had printed books when he went into battle with these people on strategy. Like, the, the, um, the Incas had none of that. Like, the Aztecs didn't say, hey, ship out, let's get these books over there in case they get attacked by these weird people from Europe. And so, um, so it's a great book. And so I totally stole this. It's kind of weird. I, I stole half of my story from, from uh, Diamond and half my story from a guy named Data. Dave McClory, who invented this concept of, oh, what is going on here? Oh, a meeting. Yeah, there you go. That's not fun. Oh, it just blew out. Yeah, it was an important meeting, I guess. Um, and so, uh, and you'll see, I took this idea from Dave McCrory, who kind of coined the, the term data gravity, and we'll get into that. But I took what he did in one of his presentations, and I used it for um, um, Jared Diamond's story. So, Diamond says that the reason why these civilizations that were haves and have nots were basically based on geography, right? And, and I say they were based on feedback loops because certain geographies like Euro-Asia created fertile ground where um, certain uh, uh, crops like wheat and things like that, um, barley, and then um, what happened is you created the, these, there were these feedback loops that happened between agriculture and the uh, geography. And then the next thing that you saw was that like, civilizations popped up around these, these kind of fertile zones, right? Um, I would call them a Goldilocks zone. Uh, Diamond doesn't use that term. But you get a feedback of people start aggregating around the domestication of, the, of, of agriculture, right? And, and uh, beast of burden. People become, um, move from hunter-gatherers. And, and then you start seeing that, um, that you start getting sophisticated tooling. Right? And, and not everybody has to be a farmer, so people start specializing. And then all of a sudden, you, so, you find that the, the specialization grows into other areas like weaponry. And you decide, well, hey, we need more of this. Let's go grab some other land areas. Right? And so you have this kind of um, you know, like multiple layers of feedback loops and something uh, Norbert Wiener would call cybernetic feedback loops. I'll recommend a book later that was awesome if you want to look into the, the cybernetics. Right? Um, cybernetics is making a comeback, folks. Um, but really, at the end of the day, what happened was there was this kind of shortened distancy and latency between the feedback loops that aggregated so condensely, the density of that became these uh, people who had amazing uh, weaponry and knowledge of strategy, and, and to a point where, again, Pizarro had these amazing malleable steel against people who basically had sticks and stones and, um, and, and, a, and a Maxim machine gun. And you had this kind of form of a terminal velocity. And so, OK, thanks, John. What does it have to do with IT? Um, Adrian Krakow, um, who was one of the main architects of Netflix, I highly recommend watching any presentation that he's given over the last three or four years. Uh, he says faster, cheaper, safer. Um, you know, when we think about DevOps, we think about all these things. We, we think about speed, how we can move fast. We think about um, lean. We think about lean startup, lean enterprise, pivot. Um, you know, minimal viable product, pivot quickly. Um, we think about uh, frictionless environments. That's what DevOps is all about, breaking down the walls between Dev and Ops, but other groups. Um, hand, frictionless handoffs. We, we talk a lot about trust. Nicole um, Forsroom is going to speak this afternoon after Josh's presentation about the DevOps survey and some of the statistic data about high trust environments and how they actually are high performers. Right? So a lot of this, and it's funny, um, Adrian uses this slide from, uh, from uh, Simon Wardley, who's another guy I worked for a while back. And he talks about like, the rest of the world, which is really web scale. And then um, you know, like, they deny it, deny it. Enterprise IT kind of keeps denying that like, this is happening until like, it's like, oh, no, no, no. Oh, I said no, oh, no. And actually, uh, Simon used a different word. He didn't use, oh, crap. I never know the audience. So you can guess what word might have been there. Um, so. So anyway, so how do you become a have, or who are the people that are likely to be the haves versus have-nots in IT? Uh, and, and I'm drawing the conclusion that it's, it's people that kind of 
understand that there's some momentum amount around, you know, let the cat out of the bag, between containers, data gravity, and microservices. So you, most of you are probably saying, what in the hell is data gravity? So Dave McCrory wrote a blog in 2010. He's got a website called datagravity.org where he said, imagine that data is like a planet and it pulls in a gravitational pull of your ser services and applications. Great. And imagine a world where we get to an IT where moving the data is kind of impossible or just not feasible. And so what if we change the whole paradigm from classically moving data to compute, we move compute to data. And what if we think about compute in a whole different way, ephemeral, shorter time to live, things like that, right? Um, so that's kind of data gravity, real short version. But if I take the feedback loop, and again, I, I stole this from Dave, Dave McCrory in a presentation video he did, almost word for word, but I used it for uh, the guns, shares, and steel. So think about the concept of data as the new center of gravity. And so let's say I have the number 32. 32 tacos, 32 containers, let's say 32 degrees. Right, that's information. So we create a feedback loop between information. Now I know that there's some meta context of the data. Right, so I create this feedback loop of information. And then, and then you apply kind of knowledge, right? And so for me, like in Atlanta, I live in Atlanta, 32 degrees, I'd like to know if it's raining. So maybe I watch the Weather Channel, the news, or something like that, and I decide if it's raining, I probably need to, if I'm going to go somewhere, leave early. Roads are kind of going to be slippery. I don't know, maybe 31 here, 33 here. I don't know. Um, so that's my feedback loop of knowledge. Again, Dave has a great presentation on this on datagravity.org. And then finally, I have this kind of action. So you can see this now in our world, like of methods and and, and microservices with knowledge, and, and we'll, 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 we'll expand on all that. But in, in my 32 degree example, I might actually go um, outside to verify. I mean, the weather was, channel was absolutely wrong. It's a gorgeous day, right? So now I've created, and again, here again, right, we see this um, overlapping uh, cybernetic feedback loop. And so what's the killer app here, or what's the have or have nots? are the ones that can shorten the distance, latency, and the throughput, the density between those feedback loops are the ones that are going to be, you know, in my opinion, the haves. And the ones that don't understand the possibility. Um, I saw a woman this morning give a presentation on, at Mount Sinai in life science. I have an order for Docker. All right, I like Docker. But I will tell you, if you're doing life sciences and you're not using containers, like you are missing a monumental opportunity uh, for uh, scale and infrastructure. Off the chart. So I, this is where I get in trouble on time. When I worked at Chef, I helped, if you haven't heard of cycle computing, Google it after this. I helped the cycle computing folk get started in Chef six years ago. And if you go Google cycle computing and see the things they've done over the last six years, with virtualization in Chef, it will blow your freaking mind. I mean, the first run was a 10,000 node machine uh, cluster on Amazon that made the top 100 supercomputer list. All right. I will tell you that will be two orders of magnitude what containers can do for, for life sciences in that regard. So the people who understand this relationship of data um, and, you know, the kind of D-I-K-A, what I'm calling, are the ones that are going to win. And, you know, like, um, you know, in Jared's story, it was 10,000 years to get to a terminal velocity, right? We're not even close, right? Um, I, I would say, so they've got 10,000 years. We had 10 years, maybe. I, um, I actually... Um, in 2009, I gave a presentation called The Cambrian Explosion at a NoSQL East presentation. And, um, you know, and it actually it became kind of the subheading for the IT revolution genes uh, thing. Uh, we use that name as part of it, right? So, um, like, the truth is, and I left other things out because my story is microservices, containers, and data gravity. But, like, this is more what the, uh, the, the orbit looks like in terms of uh, what's going on. And, you, you know, We'll talk a little about microservices in a little bit, but like a lot of people will call microservices SOA version two. Um, you know, for those of you who've been following like uh, Eric Evans' domain-driven design, uh, Heroku's 12-factor apps, right? These are all kind of in between there till we get to microservices. Really squishy, easy way to explain it. Of course, we have DevOps. Um, there is enough information to find out about DevOps. It's it's a worthy discussion to have. And then there's Docker, and um, you know. Docker didn't invent containers, right? Everybody knows that, including Docker. Um, the, um, 
you know, I love when people walk up to me, you know, Docker didn't invent containers. Like, yeah, calm down. I know that. <laughs> um, like, we know that. We do know that. Um, but, but Solaris zones, um, you know, LXC, right? And, and so what we see then is this gravitation. Again, I'll say containers. You know, my favorite container is Docker. Choose yours, but Docker is doing pretty well from a viral adoption standpoint right now. Um, we see this kind of gravitation. Um, if from information, we've, we've been pretty good. We've got a tight uh, density on information. If you think of abstractions and languages, I think our industry has done pretty well. But when we get into kind of the knowledge and, and things like actions and how we get that right, I think part of this is a story that's evolving um, to some form of acceleration. And so I say that, again, my, um, you know, my theory or my postulate is that you know, the new guns and germs of steel is containers, microservices, and data gravity. And that becomes the, um, all right, that becomes basically the new haves, or the people who are, are, are figuring this out now, and the people who understand how to figure this out um, are the ones that are going to be haves, and the people who don't understand this. And then you have this kind of colonization happen, right? Like, and I think this is interesting, too, because I think Netflix is a great, as I was rethinking, give, I gave this presentation to Austin, the DevOps days, early this year. And, um, and as I was rethinking the presentation, I mean, obviously colonization would make sense in general. But if you think about something Netflix did in early days is they colonized their partners. Um, it, it, there was some really early story about how Netflix um, didn't like the way Amazon delivered ELB, elastic load balancers, because they were delivered on like, um, very fragile infrastructure. And they mandated for them they had to do it this. And they kind of they, they shaped Amazon in a lot of ways on how they behave. And they're very outspoken about how they use SaaS strategically. And they use companies like PagerDuty. And you can go down the list and you can see a lot of presentations. And, and they've, it's very much like, and, and I won't spend too much time, but if you think about how Toyota built their ecosystem, their, um, and this is something Josh is going to talk more about, about supply chain in Toyota, but, but the idea that, um, that they basically forced their vendors in a cooperative way to behave on their values. You know, kind of almost like the Romans, if we want to stick with the history metaphor, right? Um, and, and then here again, you can see this idea of aggregate um, compute. So imagine a world now where you move compute to data, where compute has a short TTL, time to live, and you swarm maybe in thousands or tens of thousands. And so now you, and think of this, if you're familiar with the concept of a map reduce, I'm, I'm using this in the purest abstract sense. Imagine an aggregate map reduce around computing in different col colonies around data and aggregating that data up. And we're starting to see this. This is happening. So the elephant in the room, and I actually I got this. Um, so if Mark Hinkle's in the room, he's the one that gave me this idea. Um, I sometimes forget to shout out to him. But um, we had a conversation earlier when this, this announcement came out on April 2nd. Actually, it's my birthday. I didn't ever notice that. April 2nd, 2015. So um, this came out, and IBM said they're going to spend $3 billion on IoT. And then Mark pointed out to me, and I'll ask you this question, when is the last time IBM has spent this kind of money on a single technology, and what's the name of that technology? This room should totally get this one. What? Linux. Right? And how'd that turn out? Um, pretty well, right? Um, like, like, this is, you know, whether it's IBM or whatever, right? Like, um, you know, and, and I don't care whose forecast you go by. Like, data is king, right? Whether it's device driven or how we're doing things, whether, it, you know, where, um, whether it's IoT or just big data analytics, life sciences. I mean, that presentation this morning by um, Mount Sinai blew my mind. You know, flight simulators for brain surgeons. Oh, one more thing. There's a couple of things about this. Like, so I've been following this, this idea of like what data is going to look like, what our jobs might look like with data gravity and data being the center of. And so you'll see like there's stories of people using drones to do structural analysis of buildings. Imagine that. The drenched drones just going up and continuing like painting a bridge. Doing the same thing for bridges and tunnels. Uh, noise control through analytics. Actually, um, I've heard like, um, 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 noise, uh, uh, sub, sub, basically devices underwater that can check the pulse of, of, of wires underground to tell with the health of them, right? Um, if you've ever known anything about retail and beacons, store beacons, and how like these people are gaming the hell out of us 
to get us in the store. And then once we're in the store, figuring out like, like um, you know, rats in a maze of where we go once we get in the store, right? Um, I mean, the list goes on. Healthcare, I, I, um, again, is where I get in trouble. I was talking to somebody um, from Watson. And I haven't paid attention to Watson, I'll be perfectly honest with you. But I met somebody the other day who works on a project, told me two amazing stories. And I'll tell you one of them. One is they're working in a large hospital. Watson is actually saving lives. Because they're collecting a ridiculous amount of data that a human could never understand the pulse of, and literally identifying patterns of where people die if this behavior happens. Um, you know, and then, then, you know, where does Docker fit in this? Um, you know, I, I'll give you the short version. Um, I'm giving a tutorial tomorrow. Uh, Jerome's in the room, gave a full day presentation yesterday. We've got more information you'd ever want to know about how to learn what Docker does and why Docker is popular. But, um, you know, in this story, I would say first order effects is developers love Docker. They feel a sense of control. Um, they can build environments really quickly. Um, I interview a lot of um, development managers where they say their developers actually get furious if they can't converge a multi-service stack in a couple of seconds. You know, think of that with virtualization and classic infrastructure as code convergence. Um, continuous integration and web scale, I mean, it's almost, you know, running Jenkins in Docker container is almost lingua franca. Running build slaves in, in Jenkins, there's even a concept of Docker in Docker. Some people debate that. Um, but the point is, um, containerize the CI flow, you know, in web scale, pretty popular. Um, and then there's kind of these tertiary effects, like um, the, the artifact efficiencies. I do a lot of presentations on, on what I call immutable delivery. There's been a lot of discussion about immutable infrastructure. You know, this idea that you don't t ever touch or change anything in a production system. Um, and, you know, Netflix kind of described it um, early on. They, they had a, a blog article, I think, back in 2011, maybe, or maybe 13, I don't know, uh, with building systems with Legos. We talked about how to use AMIs. Well, now people are doing that model with Docker. Because the images, you literally, developers, when the time they leave their, their desktop, they, they've done their kind of first pass, and it's a binary artifact. I'll show you later a, a case study from Kilt, where um, how they do it. Like, it leaves, basically, it can leave the developer's hands through the flow immutable. And so if, the, if in DevOps we say developers should wear pages, or, or Werner Vogel say you build it, you run it, the CTO of Amazon, well, imagine you build it, you own it, and when you get woke up at three, 3 in the morning and night, it's your bits, right? Uh, again, I'm not saying that's the panacea for everything. I'm not saying run out of this room and drop everything. So if you're hearing me saying everything you're doing today is wrong, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying there are these new emergent models that need to be paid attention to. So let me just clear. Some people talk when they come up to me like, John, are you telling me I should stop everything? No. Um, and then let's get into microservices. So um, right now, I think Sam Newman, O'Reilly, he's written a book, uh, managing, uh, Building Microservices. I think it's the best book right now if you want to understand microservices. Sam Newman is an expert on it. His definition is small autonomous services that work together. He has a whole book that goes into a lot of detail, make it much more complicated than that, but an easy read. Um, I would say that my summary of seeing him speak, reading his book, he would tell you he knows when, when he sees one. But again, the book, it, like, I'm not trying to trivialize this book because um, it, it, it should have been called Microservice for Dummies because I knew nothing about microservices by the time I was done reading the book. I had a fairly good grasp of the situation. But here, I go back to Adrian Krakow. Like Again, you can see I, I've got this hero thing going on with him. But um, you know, he says, it's loosely coupled, oriented, uh, loosely coupled service oriented architectures with bounded context. And he says, basically, um, if, you're, um, if you can't independently update your services, right, then you're not loosely coupled. Right? Um, and you hear lots of stories in Sam's books about um, uh, decoupling frameworks, like this group can code in Jada, this co group can code in Python. Like you've got a complete, not only decoupling from not having to wait for the whole large monolith to be compiled together, and some people do that really well, by the way. Like Etsy will argue, like, hey, like you don't have to be, unicorns are, all, it's not just, you're not just a unicorn if you're only doing microservices. Right, um, you know, um, there are companies like Facebook and and um, I know less about Facebook, more about Etsy, that use more of a monolithic style, and they, they are blowing it out, doing really well. Um, but loosely coupled is this model. And then this is the key, and this comes kind of from the uh, Eric Ehrens, the money-driven design, um, a bounded context. There's some business context. So I like Adrian's. If I need to put a one definition together, I like Adrian's definition, but I would definitely read the book. But I love this. So, so what I'm really good at is just listening to a lot of the people speak. 
stealing their ideas, giving attribution, and then presenting their ideas. So this one comes from James Arcott, a good friend of mine. He actually works at SOAS. That we work together in strategies together. And, but I call it immutable decomposition. And I love this story, and I think it fits. So back I don't know when, those old computer scientists, there was this thing called the Joe Bentley Challenge to Donald Knuth to write a program that did this. Read a file to text, determine the end frequency words, and print out a sorted list of. And so Donald Knuth, famous um, computer scientist, um, a jack of all trades, had done a lot of things in his career. He actually wrote this elegant C program. And it was a discussion of style. It wasn't really like a competition. And um, this other gentleman, Douglas McClellory, who's considered the father of um, the kind of Linux command line chain, basically responded with, hey, what about this? Right? And, um, and it wasn't really, I mean, the competition was more about style. But th when you think about this, and I, the reason I love this is, to me, this is kind of the gold standard of what a microservice should be. None of those um, Unix functions, Linux functions or Unix functions, Linux functions, Unix, I don't know. You guys know better than me. Um, the, um, were written for the purposes of that task. They were all ephemerally put together for the composition of this service, and then psh, disappeared, moved into the composition bucket. Right? I think, to me, that's the, you know, like that, when I, when I thought about this as I was going back through microservices, I'm like, that, like, if you can build your services, I think the microservices dream for any organization would to be able to completely decouple a set of services that fit all bounds, that could globally put together, could solve almost all problems. Again, kind of mythical, but a positive vision. And so, um, I'm way ahead of time. So, um, so Gilt is a customer of um, Docker. And I love this presentation. It's one of my favorite presentations I've seen in the last couple of years, and not because they're using Docker. And, um, and not even because they're using, um, well, I guess maybe because they're using immutable infrastructure. Anyway, so let me tell you the Gilt story. How many people have heard of Gilt? Only a couple. All right. So Gilt, basically, interesting startup, um, at least six or seven, I think maybe 10 years old. And um, maybe uh, this was probably 12 years old now. But um, they, um, they basically, so designer, people who make designer shoes, bags, all those things, which I know nothing about other than I know about Gilt, um, they have surplus like everybody else. But they refused to sell their surplus in places like Target and commodity infrastructure. So the founders of Guild had this idea that what if we could run a one-hour auction every day where we could sell your goods and you can, you know, you don't like um, dilute your brand. And so basically, um, that's what they do. One hour a day, they have this auction, and people can buy, um, you know, three hundred dollars shoes for seventy dollars. They've been very successful. You can see their problem, right? Wham! Right? Um, they're reasonably famous as a microservices story because they've been very transparent about, very, very uh, associated with open source, very transparent on their trials and tribulations of trying to figure out. They started, and I, I may get the, the order wrong, but who cares, you know, with Java, then went to Ruby, then I think they tried, you know, they tried a bunch of monolithic frameworks. About three years ago, three or four, depending on when this was, they settled on a microservices architecture. Um, they, they're Amazon-based. Um, and so, so they, they've got a great story. And he tells a lot of the story. And you can see their videos of their stories about how they, um, mostly at the developer conferences, they do a lot more t discussions about how, they, you know, how they've gone to uh, microservices and why and how they've done it. Um, but what's interesting here is the two things that they talked about, at, when you get up to this point, they expressed how happy they were with Docker. And that's before I bookmarked the 20th 804. Um, and they do immutable infrastructure. But right here at this point, he says, uh, this Michael Brothers, he says, this is amazing. So he's just like talked about all this amazing stuff. And he stops, and you can see him like, like on the fly says, this is amazing. He says, right now, what we have now is our developers basically create this one file, this one meta definition, and they pass this into the pipeline, and that's basically tells how to run the Docker containers. And really, literally everything else is immutable at that point. All the way through the flow, right? And, um, and he says that, and I, I got to get my numbers right because I haven't done this presentation in a while, but he said that we have, um, we have build scripts, we have over 1,000 applications, 
seven years of, so it was not 10 years, seven years, so now it would be eight years. Eight years of, um, eight years of being in business, so it's like eight, lots of variations of versions. So uh, 1,000 repos, seven years of versions, eight year of versions, um, 25 different ways to deploy software. Just massive amount of engineering, release engineering scripts. It may be Chef, it may be Puppet, it may be this, it may be that, it might be Bash, it might be Perl, right? I don't know. And that was their dev ops. And when they went to this model, that all got pushed down to the developer. I mean, we didn't, like Chris Brown, the inventor of EC2, says there's a balloon and you squeeze the balloon and the air goes over here. I'm not saying that all goes away. But what I am saying is it all starts from the developer and, and then the process starts there and they own it. And that wasteland between dev and ops that was, and by the way, they were a poster child for DevOps in the early days, right? Like, disappeared. Like, those release, thousands of release engineering scripts for, you know, he talks about, like, you know, you know we had to deal with whether it was going to be Node or Python or Ruby or this or that or this or that. And, and we had all these ways. That's all now decided by the two pizza team, if you heard that, and that sets up the meta definition that adds the artifacts that pushes that through the system. And what he says is that all the way was not consistent with where they wanted to be in terms of how they delivered software. Um, again, it's easy to find a video if you're a geek like me. Oh, fuck. I've really never had this. It's just, do that. It, this never happens to me thing. But. So, boy, I'm, I'm really way ahead here. I'm going to have to dance. And, um, but there's plenty to talk about, though. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so I've said that the new guns, germs, and steel are containers, microservices, and data gravity. We've talked a little about microservices. I, I think I've given you an introduction to data gravity, why it might be important. Containers, it, you know, it should be reasonably obvious. I mean, um, let me give you a couple more metadata points on, on containers. Um, the, so on average, you know, and, and mileage varies, but a container instantiates in about 400 milliseconds. On a good day, a virtual image is well over a minute. Could be a couple of minutes. Um, it, this is just a, a, um, a, a practice of style, but it tends to fit the container model. People will use things like Zookeeper or something like Console, etcd, for their convergence. So you see, um, especially in a microservices architecture, you see less use of things like infrastructure as code and more reliance on the convergence using um, some type of key value store. So you actually can see like multi-service stacks, five, six, 15 stacks, converge in three seconds, two seconds. Um, convergence with something like, and again, I, I have stock in ops code, Chef, so they're gonna put my kids through college. This is an, this is an attack on infrastructure as code. Uh, there's still lots of value, many value in, in Puppet Chef, Financeable, and all the other ones. Um, but the truth is that convergence time can be eight, 10 minutes, depending on how you converge, you know, a database connecting to, uh, depending on whether you're using search or different forms of how do, you get, how do you get multiple services to talk to each other and know about their IP and hosting and all that good stuff, right? Um, so speed, the size, right? Um, for those of you who don't, um, uh, don't know much about the containers, they share the host. So the size of those, you don't have a replicated VMDK or AMI, which is a full operating system. You're really left with the libraries and the application is only part of the system. So just you get this immense density of, of compute on a machine because you're not wasting resources for all the operating systems because you're sharing that, which then adds to the speed. So there's this paper, um, I'll have it in my presentation tomorrow, not I, like if you come tomorrow, I'm really not trying to sell it, but, and, and I'll make it public, but there's a presentation, I'll have a link to it by IBM, they did last year, and we've made some significant performance improvements since then, where they talk about, they did a full study on containers and a lot of this study on Docker, and uh, the scenario, one of the scenarios in the paper is um, is, and I'll tweet this out because it's a really good paper, but one of the scenarios where they started serially 150 a, a Docker container, Apache, just a simple Apache application as Docker containers, 150, and it took 36 seconds. 150. Right? And um, it was the average, um, the average spin up time is 100 milliseconds. Or again, it was just a splash screen, it wasn't anything important, but like, that blows my mind, right? Um, all right, so who are the potential haves today? You know, whether you hate them, love them, whatever. Google. Two years ago, 
they came out publicly and said they ran about 2.2 billion containers a week. They've been running containers, and there's probably Google people in this room, they're way better than me. I'd say on the off chance, at least 10 years, but certainly probably seven or eight years guaranteed they've been in this container thing. They're doing a lot of other cool things, right? Like, I always joke, whatever they're telling us they're doing now, like it's probably three or four years old of what they're really doing now, right? So if they're saying 2.2 billion two years ago, I can't even imagine what's going on. Like, like, they, like for running infrastructure, again, whether you like Google or hate Google or whatever, like you can't deny they are haves. Their culture, the way they've built that. Amazon. I mean, Amazon's had some bad press lately, but they've also had some good press. Their cloud service business, six billion a year. Um, they're gonna do 100 billion in revenue, right? Like, and you know, I mean, they're demolishing the competition, right? Unquestionably. Um, Netflix, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, they're, they're kind of smaller in the sense of Google and Amazon, but their architecture is amazing. If you want to study how a have has to look today, look at the way they're doing their infrastructure. It's absolutely amazing on culture, everything. They, 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 they build around fail fast. Uh, you've probably, every industry has probably heard about Chaos Monkey. Uh, we had Adrian Cockroft on our uh, Davos pod podcast. I asked him, how do you get to 060 for Chaos Monkey? You know, it, it's a culture thing. If you come in there and interview and you haven't read their CEO's deck and understood it, it's an immediate, you don't get hired. If you, if you haven't looked at their open source projects and when they question you about Chaos Monkey and you hadn't heard of it, like you're not going to get hired. Um, Adrian says that, you know, he's not the genius behind the architect. He was, he, what he says is, I got the right books to the right people. And one of the books he got to the right people was something called Release It by Mike Nygaard, which has something called circuit breaker patterns in there. And you can't do Chaos Monkey without circuit breaker patterns. I don't have enough time to tell you about circuit breaker patterns. Look it up or read Mike's book. Um, and then, you know, my kind of favorite Etsy, I think, you know, I, I do a lot of, uh, I'll show you a couple of book lists here in a minute. You know, Etsy nails culture. They're doing pretty good. They IPO'd, I don't know if it was early this year or late last year. I think it was early this year. They're doing really well. In the grand scheme, they're not the size of these guys, but like they nail culture. It's a blameless, you know, if those of you have not, don't follow John Ospar, you really should. It's a safety culture 101. Everything they have on the blog, they think of themselves as artisans in IT. In fact, their, their, their blog site is uh, Code is Craft. It, it's just, it, it, it flows culture. And in DevOps, we say, um, I, I'm one of the co-authors of this loose taxonomy called CAMS, Culture Automation Measurement and Sharing. If you can't get the culture right, don't bother with the automation. Literally, stop, go home. Go sell shoes, not on the internet. Um, so, um, you know, getting near to conclusion, you know, data is the new center of gravity. You know, maybe not for every application, but you know, I once someone tell me that, like, going back to the shoe thing, like, you know, people who make shoes don't need cloud. This is like four or five years ago in some cloud roundup table. I'm like, yeah, go to Nike and tell them that. Um, Docker is the killer app for microservices. And data gravity is the killer app for Docker. Um, people hate me because they usually wind up with long reading lists. Sorry. Um, I think complexity, I didn't have time to really go into depth of complexity. You know, we talked a little bit about release it from Mike Nygaard, circuit breaker patterns. Um, we've been doing, in fact, thanks to John Ospar, we've brought in um, people like Sidney Decker, uh, Woods and Cook at, at University of Ohio. Uh, Ohio State, sorry. These are people that I think Cook went in to Three Mile Island to figure it out. Sidney Decker, his first job was that um, Airbus that flew into a mountain. They go in and they figure out why human factors matter in disasters. They're now talking to us about our world and trying to figure this out. So a lot of people, that was one of the books Adrian passed along, was Drift into Failure. Uh, Mark Burgess, you know, basically the inventor of you know, Desired State Configuration, Magic Convergence, um, it's, it's a strong book to read. Um, Designing Delivery, Jeff Sussner, amazing book. I, I would call almost UOX for DevOps. He talks about, he gives a very in-depth discussion about complexity and cybernetics. He's a cybernetics freak. Um, how many people run the Phoenix Project? Right, everybody in this room should read the Phoenix Project. I'm sorry, it's a novel. And you'll read it and you'll say, how did Gene Kim sneak into my building? 
That's what you'll say. I guarantee. In fact, when you read it, you'll remember that I said that, and you'll laugh again. Um, if you have the time, you haven't read the book, go read the original version. What Gene did, his life mission was to rewrite a book written in the 80s um, called The Goal by Elliot Gorey, the guy who defined the concept of theory of constraints. Recently, I read two books, uh, Mike Rother by Toyota Kata. It uh, somebody last night said it changed my life. I'm not going to go that far. But um, he talks about the invisible side of what Toyota did. So short story. From about 1960 to about 2000, to Toyota just destroyed everybody in the automobile. Just destroyed. I mean, things have changed. Some of those guys need to figure out what went wrong. But unquestionably, this is a company that just dominated. And Mike Rother explains how they did it. He talks about the invisible side, the kata, the memory muscle. And then um, if you want to read back to back, like, this is why people really hate me, because I tell them, no, oh, oh, don't just read that book. You've got to read it in this order. So read the goal. Like, you can do these two independently, but read the goal and the Phoenix Project, read Toyota Kata, then read High Velocity by Steven Spears. Steven Spears gives um, like brilliant case studies. He never uses the word kata. Uh, but he definitely does this amazing job. He has the story of Alcoa and how they changed um, the whole safety, really, literally safety, people dying. I think the, he said that the chances, when he got there to Alcoa, the chances of you knowing somebody who died was like, it was like you were going to know somebody who died from an accident. And when you left, the chances were, and I'm blowing the numbers, like one in 60,000. Um, a couple more things. Um, I got a couple minutes. There was one thing I... I did miss. Uh, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about Josh Corman's presentation because we did a presentation together uh, called Immutable Awesomeness. And he's given the supply chain presentation next. And um, it's incredibly important. So if you bought into this whole model of what I'm talking about here, and like it is, if you want to see the security mindset of how that applies to this, Josh has got an amazing story. And um, so I would, I would definitely. Um, Highly recommend that. Going to that, um, you're going to hear some like interesting ways of how you would apply security. So we haven't left security out. Um, you know, one of the reasons we did the presentation together was I knew that immutable infrastructure in this kind of model would be hard to operate. And what Josh was doing, kind of independently, is talking about a cleaner way to operate through a supply chain model. Um, I guess that's all I have uh, today. Um, I don't know if I have time for questions or not. Um, Sure. The yeah, the mic might be the best. Yeah. You've spoken quite a bit about containers for this kind of data gravity model. Uh, do you have any thoughts on AWS Lambda and that programming paradigm and how it? Say that uh, again. You've spoken quite a bit about containers uh, and how this affects data gravity and whatnot. Have you uh, given any thought to AWS Lambda and how that changes? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I think uh, it, it's inevitable. It's, uh, yeah, you know, coming down the pike, uh, Lambda, um, you know, um, you, that, that whole model of kind of um, transactional compute, um, ephemeral, you know, from the start. Um, I think, you know, I, I've been kind of looking at unikernels a little bit lately, too. Um, I think that they might model Lambda a little bit. As well, so yes, I think yeah, I think it all fits. I, I think, and, and what you're going to see is like virtualization is not going away. OS level virtualization, which is Docker, and kind of um, going back to kind of bare compute in in a, in a very single purpose operating system model. Um, uh, I think all three are going to exist, and then the key is the people to know how to use which patterns in which examples. So none of this is an either or a binary like. This is the way it's, it's not going to be Lambda versus Docker. It's not going to be Docker versus virtualization. You had a question about a slide? Oh, sure, sure. That was an easy one. 